Will you please pray with me? God, we ask that it is you we hear and feel in these words and in this place. Amen. Amen. One day when I was little, uh, so I was at that age where you weren't allowed in your parents' room, like for any reason whatsoever, because you break a lot of stuff or you take things, you know, really little. I remember sneaking in there. I was very stealthy to get in, and I snuck in, and I got over to my parents, my mom's dresser, and she had one of those low but really long dressers, so like maybe only three or four drawers high, but two sets of them. And on the top of this dresser was all kinds of makeup and jewelry and other shiny things, and I was mesmerized at all the colors and all of the, the shininess. And shininess, and then I came across something that at first seemed normal, but as I played with it, it kind of surprised me. It was one of these. You seen one of these? Yeah. On the one side, it's just a normal mirror, and when I look into it, I see myself, but I also see all of my surroundings. I can see all of you out there. But the other side, we all know the other side, right? But the other side... It presents me with a picture that is both amusing and slightly terrifying. It is a magnified version of me. I've probably all played with one of these at some point, or used one maybe. I've never had to use one, but I like to play with them. And some people might need to use them. But I think we all know about these mirrors. And now that we've moved through our study of believe, it's time for us to look into one of these. And we'll start with this normal mirror first, because when I look into it, like I said, I do see myself, but I can see all of you around me. So we need to look at our collective reflection and ponder, what is it that we as a church are telling the world? What is it that we as a church are telling our community? And we're going to start this by having you tell me how to draw a church. So if we are building Christ's church from scratch, what are the things we need? A foundation? Like what? Okay. I'll, I'll just draw a line. So that's a foundation. What, other th what do we need if we're building a church? People. Okay. Christ. How am I supposed to draw that? What do we need? What? What? Someone say, money. Should that money be as big as the cross? Okay, just checking. Put it over there. What should the church believe? Why didn't anyone say a giant whiteboard? There's no giant whiteboard on things that are needed, right? Nobody said pews either. But what, what, what should the church believe? What should it do? What should it be? It's a good thing we're looking in this mirror. What? Help the community. Okay. So the church shouldn't be stuck here, but it needs to go out here, right? Invite it. So it should also be bringing these in here. I think it's really good that we're looking into this mirror because as we progress through believe, I think this is what stuck out. It said that we believe that the God of the Bible is the one true God, that God cares about everyone and loves all, that the church is God's primary way to accomplish the gospel, the good news on earth, and that we are all called to show compassion to everyone. 
Those were the big core beliefs in the first 10 chapters that, as we discussed in Sunday school, really stood out to us and really meant something to us as a community here. And so the question becomes, do we show those things to our community? If we are building a church, do we build it around the ideas that God, that the God of the Bible is the one true God, and that God cares about everyone, and that God loves everyone, and that the church, us, we are God's primary way to show and to carry out the good news in the world. Do we show compassion to everyone? Do we show all that to our community? Well, we should be worshipful, we should be prayerful, we should be Bible-centered community that gives of itself to serve others, and we should be loving, joyful, peaceful, hope-filled, patient, faithful, humble, and a good community. Do we show that in our drawing of a church? Is that what we reflect to our community? Paul writes to the church in Galatia how they should be, and he says this, he says, The actions that are produced by selfish motives are obvious. Those things that we do that are just about us, they're really obvious to figure out. Here's a list of them. They include sexual immorality, moral corruption, doing whatever feels good, idolatry, drug use, casting spells, hate, fighting, obsession, losing your temper, competitive opposition, conflict, selfishness, group rivalry, jealousy, drunkenness, partying, and other things like that. How many of us found ourselves in that list? Yeah, if we're honest, we're in there. Every single one of us is motivated by selfish things at some point in time. He continues on. And he says this to, to the Galatians, but he's saying it to us also. He says, I warn you, as I have already warned you, that those who do these, th- these kinds of things won't inherit God's kingdom. If that's what drives us, we're not going. We're not moving towards God's kingdom. But he doesn't stop there. He says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. How many of us found ourselves in that list? Maybe not this morning, but maybe at some point in time, we hope, right? There is no law against things like this. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the self with its passions and its desires. If we live by the Spirit, let's follow the Spirit. Are we as a community crushing those selfish desires so that we might be more fruitful in those gifts of the Spirit? I think we know that as a church, we need to decide what we believe and what we stand for and how we can best communicate our beliefs to our community. Because it is through this sharing and growing of our faiths that we will build God's church. It's not about a building. It's about a community. So I think going through Believe got us started down that path, but there's still a lot of work for us to do as a community to reflect on who it is we should be. We can't do that all today, though. We'll be here way too long, and you probably won't like it. So we're going to go ahead, and we're going to flip this mirror. We're going to look at that terrifying picture now. On this side, I don't need to look at it again, because I already did, but on this side, if I look into it, all I see is me, and every imperfection of me magnified. It's easier for us actually to be introspective as a group than it is for us to be introspective of just ourselves. Because in a group we can think, well, I'm not really the one that's bad. It's the other people around me. I'm the good one. But when we're looking at ourselves, we see every imperfection. And Jesus tells us to look inward He says, remove the plank from your own eye before you try to remove the speck of dust from another's. And so we're going to work on those planks this morning. So we built a church over here, but I want us to now build a Christian. A Christ follower. What makes a Christ follower? belief. Faith. Example. 
example. Do it. Hmm? Doing for others. Did you say compassion, Russ? Action. And compassion? Humility, that's a good one. Love. Empathy? We're getting a good list now. I think we're getting the hang of this. Hmm? All the chapters of the book, I know. <laughs> Almost like there was a design for that. <laughs> right? It's, it's really set up to help us with this. What makes a Christ follower? Well, really, we need to think, act, and be like Jesus, the one whom we're supposed to be following. And that's easier said than done. It's way easier for us to make this list than to actually do all of these things, isn't it? Just like it's, it's way easier to go and buy all the makeup. I don't know this from experience, but I know that there's a reason that there's a super magnified mirror. It's way easier to buy all the makeup than it is to apply it perfectly, right? Those of you who, who put it on. Yeah. It's easier said than done. Randy Frazee asks us a question to help us understand how simple thinking, acting, and being like Jesus can be. He tells us each to ask ourselves, am I happier when I hang out with an impatient, arrogant, selfish, pessimistic person or those filled with love, joy, gentleness, and peace? Which makes us happier? The second one. So which kind of person should we be? We should be people that are filled with love, joy, gentleness, and peace. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5.17, If anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. Frazee reminds us that Jesus is inviting us to become a new person. He wants to heal us from our past put pain, shame, and guilt in the rearview mirror. He wants to make a difference in our present, to experience the fullness of Christ's blessings today. He wants to invite us to be fully involved in his future plans, to be a part of the new kingdom that is built for all. And so we need to ask, have we accepted this invitation to live up to these things of being a Christ follower? To allow Christ into our lives in ways that are meaningful enough that we reflect Him in all we think, act, and are. So how do we accept this invitation? It's more than just saying words. The first thing we need to do is embrace the vision that Jesus has for our lives. And so I'm going to go through a series of questions with you that I want you to ask yourself these questions. And each one's going to be up on the screen. And the first question is, how would my life improve and my relationships be strengthened if I sacrificially and unconditionally loved and forgave others? And for those of you who want these questions, I'll put them up on Facebook later. So you don't have to try to write them all down now. But how would our life improve and our relationships be strengthened if we could actually sacrificially and unconditionally love and forgive others, not hold grudges? The next question that we need to ask ourselves is how would my life improve and my relationships be strengthened if I had inner contentment and purpose in spite of my circumstances? If we knew and believed that we were called even when things around us seemed to be falling apart. And that we could find joy in our faith. The next question that we have to ask ourselves is, how would my life improve and my relationships be strengthened if I was free from anxiety because things are right with God, others, and myself? Wouldn't it be great to just be at peace for once? The next is, how would my life improve and my relationships be strengthened if I took a long time to overheat and endured patiently under life's pressures? Nobody wants patience, right? We want other people to have patience. And yet patience is a virtue that we all need. 
The next one is, how would my life improve and my relationships be strengthened if I chose to do the right things in my relationships with others? The next one is, how would my life improve and my relationships be strengthened if I established a good name with God and others based on my long-term loyalty in those relationships? We all want faithful friends and a faithful community, but we have to participate in those relationships. The next is, how would my life improve and my relationships be strengthened if I was thoughtful, calm, and considerate in my dealings with others? The next is, how would my life improve and my relationships be strengthened if I had the power through Christ to control myself? And we all have those interactions that we replay in our heads of we wish we had done it a different way, that we had said something different, that we had held our tongue. How would my relationship improve and my relationships be strengthened if I coped with the hardships of life and faced with courage the prospect of death through the hope I have in Jesus Christ? To know that this isn't the end. And to believe it and to live with that hope. And the last question we should be asking ourselves is how would my life improve and my relationships be strengthened if I chose to esteem others above myself? If you notice, these are the last 10 chapters of belief of who we should be becoming as we follow Christ. The answer to each of these questions is found in the scriptures attached to each chapter. And if you become this type of person, what difference would it make in your life? What difference would it make to the people around you? Then what if those folks, all of your neighbors, your friends, your family, also embraced this vision and offered the same virtues back to you? Then we would see a community filled with God's qualities. This is the description of life in the kingdom to come. Jesus is inviting us to start living this new way of life right now. But envisioning a life in Christ is just the beginning because intentions follows vision. A person who has a vision but no intention is a mere dreamer. Our children need more than just a vision for independence. They need to form an intention and a plan, right? So it is with the spiritual life as well. We must be intentional, deliberate, meditative, calculating, and purposeful about becoming like Jesus. And Peter sums it up this way. Make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness mutual affection, and to mutual affection love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, don't just get them and stop, but in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. So therefore we must make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will not stumble and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal world of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We need to be intentional. We didn't put that on here. But we need to be intentional about who we are and who we're becoming. If we are living into Jesus' vision for us, then we must continually grow as Christ followers, not be complacent church attenders. To move beyond mere good intentions, we need to put in place a thoughtful, practical plan for progressing toward Christ-likeness. So what would this plan look like? We can see that vision that Jesus wants us to be this person and in this community and we understand that our intentions matter in what we're doing. That they can't be empty actions. But what would a plan look like to actually be an intentional Christian community? Or an intentional Christ follower? How could you do that? Dedication. If 
I, if you needed to buy a new car, you would set a plan, right, on how you're going to afford it, correct? Most people would, right? You would maybe figure out your budget, maybe figure out how much you can save up beforehand if you want to pay for it all up front, if you want to pay for part of it and then finance the rest, you'd get finance numbers, right? You do all of that just to buy a car. What about to be a Christ follower? What things should we be planning and doing? Hmm? Yes. Prayer. Bible study. Example. Discipleship. Now you're testing my spelling. Okay. Involving. Inviting. Others. Since I wrote this, I got I had the time to actually make a list, so I'll share my list with you. <laughs> I had a head start. Some of it's up there. Bible study, being a part of a biblical community, Sunday school, prayer partners, worship, prayer alone, setting aside time to read scripture. Right? Those are just the basic things that should be part of a plan on how to become a Christ follower. So how can you do these in your life? Can you and are you willing? For all of us who are serious about becoming a new person in Christ, this process doesn't happen overnight. Living into this plan doesn't just happen. Each step in this grace-filled walk will breathe life into our weary and guilt-ridden souls. I found that I am still growing And that I hope I will continue to grow for many more years. Jesus is making me a better husband, a better father, a better friend, a better neighbor, and a better pastor as I learn to walk with him. And Jesus doesn't dangle the Christian life in front of us like a carrot on a stick that we can never capture. This abundant life, this life of being an intentional Christian is something that is available to us right now. Jesus offers it to all of us right now, today. But we need to put in the work of intentionally envisioning and carrying out plans to help us individually and communally think, act, and be like Christ. Do we want to do that? I saw like three people nod their heads. That's not very, very comforting. Do we want to be an intentional community that follows Christ? Do we want to be intentional individuals as Christians who show that love, that grace, that gentleness, that forgiveness, that hope to others? Yes, I pray we do. And I pray that we put in the work so that we can show our community that we want to think, act, and be like Jesus. Amen.